So when I spoke to Jill, you guys all know Jill, right? All right. About coming here. <laughs> about coming up here and speaking. Um, it was a little intimidating. I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, she, she's told me some of the great speakers you guys have had before, the likes of uh, Malcolm Gladwell. And anybody who's been around speaking while well knows that he's one of the most prophetic storytellers in the world. What you didn't warn me about, well, two things. One, you didn't tell me that Dr. Fisher was a comedian. <laughs> and you didn't tell me the opening act would be better than, than the main presenter. <laughs> so, second thing you didn't tell me was that I was gonna be coming here wounded. You know, I'm from the city of Chicago. I'm going to walk out now. <laughs> That's how I get you back. And uh, I want to tip my hat to you guys. That was a good series. I'm going to go home. I'm going to go to the United Center. I'm going to stare up at the three Stanley Cup championships we've won in the last five years. <laughs> you still got the Cubs. <laughs> and the World Series we won last year. How's your baseball team, by the way? Um, <laughs> I can do comedy too, doctor. <laughs> See, I even heard Go Bears when I walked by. See, Nashville's a pretty transient city, right? How many people are actually from Nashville here? Okay, so about half. About half. That's not bad. Well, I'm really excited to be here, and I'm really, really glad that so many of you guys woke up and drank coffee with me. This is tea, by the way. I don't do coffee anymore. But I'm, I'm, I am very, very excited to come here and to pace around and walk with you guys. I told uh, everybody in the crew that if I stand behind this lectern for more than about 30 seconds, you may assume I've had a seizure and you should call somebody. I like to walk around, it helps me. I'm, I have a ton of energy. And so I'm really excited to talk today though, not about hockey, uh, not about uh, my partnership or any, uh, I am here to talk a little bit about dragons, but I'm gonna make that tie make sense from a business standpoint here really, really soon. I am glad to know that I did fly here on American and I made it safely. I was not beaten at any time uh, during my transportation. I was taken safely to my hotel and uh, Jill got me here right on time this morning. Okay, so that's the end of the, the stand-up hour. Now let's, let's get a little more intimate though. Um, you guys travel a lot, some of you, right? A lot of executives in the room. Travelers? Just nod, you don't have to raise your hand. I don't want this to get exhausting for you guys. All right. Um, Travel is one of these really, really profound things. Have you thought about how much travel has changed your lives and changed in your lives in the last five to 10 years? Anybody remember the days of airline tickets? You get them in the mail and you'd have your, your hotel reservation, you'd have confirmation numbers, papers, tickets, and you'd, you'd fly around with a folder and you'd have all your stuff, and you were actually thinking about it. I wanna tell you about how I travel now. So I wake up, usually I like to travel really early in the morning, and I wake up and it's, uh, you know, if I have a six o'clock flight, I'm planning to be at the airport no later, Chicago O'Hare by the way, no later than 5.15, because I need a lot of time to be, be ready. That's not actually a lot of time. Um, but I like my sleep, and I have one thing with me, and it's up here, I have this device. I have this device in my pocket, in my hand, and I got a bunch of apps on it, right? I've got a hotel app, I've got an airline app, I've got, I've got all these different apps that basically my whole world is managed by. And technology has basically allowed me to not worry anymore about planning the way I live, the way I move, the way I travel, right? I'm actually able to get on the airline, I'm able to upgrade my ticket, I'm able to check in my reservation, I'm able to order my car service, I'm able to you know, pick my seats, I'm able to, everything I'm about to do, that entire experience can be controlled by that device. But 
every day the way we interact with technology. How many of you guys have really paid attention to how much your interactions with technology have changed in the last few years? Do you notice it? Do you think about when you're embracing your technology on a day in and day out basis? Because I went through all that at the airport and I was telling my story and I said, you know, on this plane, and a couple weeks ago I went to another really awesome city. Nashville, by the way, is an awesome city. I really think this is a great place. This isn't like one of those things like, you know, the, the, the musician that comes up on stage every time and he's like, hey, Toledo, Ohio, this is the city rocks, you know, and it's like, what, Toledo? You guys have like four jobs left. Um, it, it, Nashville's just a really, really wonderful city, but last week I did a keynote for a company called Xenos, and I was in Austin, Texas. You guys familiar with Austin? And I think you guys are like sister cities. I think there needs to be like an official affiliation between Nashville and Austin, because you two are two of the coolest musical, tech, just forward-thinking cities in the world. But I was traveling down there, and I had a really big emotional experience that I want to share with you guys before I get into all my dragon research. Um, on the airplane, I sat down, it was an American 737, and I had this screen right in front of me, right? You guys been on those planes yet? Anywhere in that you have the entertainment, mobile? This is really cool, because if you've traveled for a long time, you realize the ability to plug in and listen to mu in music or watch a movie is life-changing. To having internet on the flight, I mean, this stuff makes travel so much easier. Well, on the little screen, I, I sit down in my seat and, <sighs> You know, I've been having, I've been away from my family a lot because I'm traveling and up comes In Theaters Now. And I hit the little In Theaters Now because I want to see what movies I can see. I never have time to go to the movies. Who goes to the movies anymore? It's a good idea, but no one gets there. This movie pops up, Collateral Beauty. And I want to, Will Smith, you guys familiar with this movie? Um, and the week before I was at an IBM event and I heard Will Smith talk about Collateral Beauty. And if you've ever heard him speak, he's really, really, uh, well, I mean, obviously he's a famous actor, but he's just really passionate about what he does. And he told the story of Collateral Beauty. I'm like, oh, this is perfect. Long week, I'm gonna plug in, I'm gonna listen, and I'm gonna watch Collateral Beauty. And uh, I turn this movie on, and I get about halfway through it, and I'm bawling my eyes out. Um, and there's a backstory to this, because I haven't cried in 20 years. I've had, I've had, <laughs> I've had three children. I've given, my, I've given birth. My wife's given birth to three children. <laughs> I've, I've been married, I've been through hardship, I've been through loss, and it was something about, I tell the story, you know, I was, a, I was an athlete as a kid, and I played college soccer, but I was a baseball player when I was about 14 years old, and my dad told me after I, I was pitching a game, and I would managed to start crying on the mound. I always got really upset when someone would hit off me, like I was like expected to pitch a perfect game, and, I, and he yelled at me on the way home and said, you need to quit crying, and literally that day I never cried again for 20 years. So I'm bawling my eyes out. I'm having this huge emotional moment. And in the, the movie, Claro Beto, I don't want to spoil it all for you, was all about a, f a, a father's grieving over the loss of his, his child. And, and, and I'll let you guys go see it. And I really, really recommend it. But, you know, being away from my family for so long, I was just feeling really emotional. I have a nine-month-old son. I have a 15-year-old daughter and a nine-month-old son. You want the backstory on that, I'll do it really quickly. So if I embarrass myself enough, the rest of this presentation will go really well. Um, when my kids were 13 and nine, I have two older daughters, and when they were 13 and nine, I finally got grandma and grandpa to watch them so I could take the wife to Paris. And I came home and I brought home my son. <laughs> so now I have a 15 and 11 and a nine month old. So that, that's what happens. But I'm really missing my son, you know, and nowadays with technology, with Facebook, with Instagram, with Snapchat, you know, my daughter's sending me pictures of my son starting to walk, starting to cruise furniture. And I'm like, you know, I'm like welled up. And I think after 20 years of not having an emotional moment, I'm sitting there and I'm watching a movie. And again, the movie was good, but I'm crying like, you know, I'd lost my mother. I mean, I'm literally like, <laughs> and what I realized is, is, is all this technology is, it's not about tech. And that's this big connection that so many of us are missing. What people are really seeking is, this meaningful, is a meaningful relationship with their worlds. And as we think about all of the business that we're in and all the ways that technology fits into our work, one of the biggest problems that we have is so many people are pushing technology into their companies, or if you're selling technology, you're selling technology for technology's sake. But when you think about 
your engagement with tech. Why do you do social media? Why does anybody do social? Do you do social media because it's cool technology? You want to be more connected to people, right? You want to have conversations. You, you want to expand your reach, make new friends, be connected to new parts of the world. You're seeking the experience that technology can bring you. When you turn on that, that hockey game where your goalie who cheated for four games straight <laughs> and you watch that game, just for that moment, you're turning off reality, right? You kind of disconnect yourself from thinking about work or thinking about life. That technology creates an experience for you. When you're playing a game on your mobile phone, right? I'm sure none of you guys ever play games and pretend to be working. But when you're playing that game, it's all this stuff. We're just creating these meaningful experiences. And, and that's what so many people need to make sure they're thinking about. So I have an exclusive for you guys today. So that's very exciting. Um, this past six months, my firm, Futurism, as Dr. Fisher called it, um, <laughs> I'm gonna just keep going on you. You started so well, I, I gotta make sure I get myself back on top before this one's over. Futurism research. <laughs> and we've spent the last six months studying digital transformation. Now this is what you guys hopefully came to hear, not my jokes or my, my funny little stories about me crying. Although it does, it is kind of funny, right? Did you guys all picture that? Like this <laughs> big, bald, meat-headed guy sitting in like the fourth row, just bawling his eyes out, everyone looking at him like, what's wrong with you? Um, I wish someone had taken a picture. I would have put a big picture of it up there. But yeah, we've been studying this term digital transformation. You guys hear this term before? You guys, raise your hand, show of hands, let's do this, exercise time. Have you heard the term? Because I want to make sure, if you haven't heard the term, I want to explain it to you because it's going to be an important topic for the rest of this presentation. Yes? Yes? Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just quickly kind of explain what, what I believe it is. Because digital transformation, like unified communications, or you know, like relationships is one of those things that can be very complex. Um, but I, I break it down into two very simple categories. Two words, digital and transformation, okay? Digital being all the things that technology can power, all the things that technology can change, and transformation is really a people thing. Transformation happens because of culture and people. And so we're studying the impact that technology has on culture, but also the impact that culture has on technology. And what we're trying to understand is how businesses are preparing themselves for all this change. Disruption, right? We've all heard the term disruption. And not only how do you prepare, but then how do you actually go on and become successful when you've seen so many companies who were the biggest, strongest incumbents in their industry go. So I want to share a little bit of this. And, 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 and I, I can't spoil the whole study. But a couple of organizational, technological, and other trends that basically we found. But that we talked to thousands of executives in IT and entrepreneurs and businesses to basically determine how long do businesses think they have before the digital movement is going to cause them pain and suffering. And, and just a, you can just nod a little bit at me, but how many of you guys have felt the pinch of digital on your businesses? How many of you, no matter what I ask you, are not gonna nod or raise your hand? <laughs> This is a small room. We should make friends. One day I may be sitting in your speech, and you're going to want me to raise my hand. <laughs> well, the first thing we were trying to figure out is how long do companies think they have? And, and on average, the response was companies believe they have five years. And anybody in this room that thinks they have five years, and I'm going to talk about a couple of companies throughout this presentation, but the story of one of my favorite stories to tell is the story of Blockbuster and Netflix. 
and it's because everybody can relate. And I want to talk more about them later, so I don't want to spoil it now. But just so you know, in 2009, the CEO, Jim Keyes of Blockbuster Video, said he had nothing to worry about with that little Netflix company. In 2010, he had the opportunity to buy that little Netflix company for $50 million. In 2013, they were closing their last 300 stores. That was less than four years. Now, something to think about. How much has technology evolved between 2013 and now? How many things are you doing today with data, with virtual reality, with Internet of Things, with AR, with uh, artificial intelligence that in 2013 didn't exist? That disruption cycle is getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. So we think this discovery that executives think they have five years still, and I'm going to show you some data later on of why that's a very, very risky proposition to believe you have that much time to change your business. The second thing, <clears throat> and I'm sure there are a few vendors in here that sell tech. In fact, I've talked to a couple this morning. So take this for what it's worth and don't be offended when I say this. But the overarching theme was that most companies are hyper-dependent on their tech vendors when making technology buying decisions. Okay? Now, I'm a vendor-sided analyst. So my clients are Microsoft. My clients are Dell, Cisco. So if this video gets out, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble. But I heard it's private. Guess what, guys? Do you think they want you to buy something from them? One of the biggest risks I believe a business has is not doing their own research. And companies for ages have said, oh, we want to be in cloud. So we talk to our Google person, our Amazon person, our Microsoft person. We need to get infrastructure. We talk to our Dell, our Cisco, our HPE person. They're going to tell us what we need, and we're going to do it. What do you think their interest is? Of course they want a good outcome for you. These companies have not become multi-billion dollar global enterprises by doing terrible things for their, their clients. But at the same time, who's, who understands your business the best, hopefully? So in this research, finding that companies are letting external decision makers that have a bias towards selling their own solutions to you become your number one, I know, don't be mad at me if you're in the tech space for saying this, it's about partnership. That's the real theme of our research. It's not about pushing them out. It's about the fact is you cannot expect them to deliver you the right solution if you're depending on them to tell you what it is. You have to understand your business problems, your business objectives, what you're trying to solve. Because after all, a digital transformation, your number one, two, and three things Grow revenue, grow profits, in, in, increase employee satisfaction, and the fourth thing, reduce attrition. That's why you transform. Not because there's new technology. You transform because you want to become successful. That's what it is. So when I talked about what digital transformation is, and I talked about tech and people, you guys ever heard the term change management? Just think of it that way, and it'll make the term a lot less comp uh, complex in your mind. And the last stat was not staggering to me, but was overwhelmingly interesting, is that less than a third of companies are actually considering themselves digital. Now, how long have we had? Do you know what year Netflix was started? Just since we kind of had that story going. Anyone want to take a guess? What? Not that old. Yeah, 99, I think, 99. Yeah, 98, 99 was when they came into market. Almost 20 years old. They've been doing streaming and digital for over a decade. And companies are still not digital. And to me, it's absolutely mind-boggling how a company cannot have evolved to basically serve the new marketplace. How do you guys buy? How do you buy? How do you consume? What's the first thing you do when you're buying anything? Zappos. Zappos.com? You're a shoe guy. <laughs> you just buy anything from Zappos. Pants, yes. Servers. I don't know what a server is. So probably not from Zappos. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, you can buy servers from Amazon. You can buy anything from Amazon. 
There was a recent report that came out that showed all the stores from Sears, Kmart, JCPenney, Abercrombie Limited of the number of closing, closings of these stores. You're talking hundreds of stores. You know your favorite little parts store for fixing your uh, TV at home, Radio Shack? By 2020, they will close 500 stores. Almost all these businesses will be exclusively digital. But any company on the planet that doesn't think about how they need to become digital is missing the point. So if you think you have five years and you're in that two thirds, you are ripe to be put out of business. And that's not like, a, oh, I'm being scary. It's just true. And it's really something we all need to be thinking about. So let's talk a little bit about the technology trends that we discovered. First, <clears throat> and again, I know everybody's level of technology aptitude is different, so I'm trying to keep everything kind of on the very simple level. But short term, what we found from these, these survey respondents was cloud and big data are where people are making their biggest investments. Now, how many of your companies have moved some part or all of your computing services to cloud? So you guys fit into this demographic. Now the other side of it is big data, and I had a conversation this morning, uh, Tony here, we were talking about big data, and we've done research on gut decision making versus data driven leadership, right? Great leaders of the past were known for their gut decision. I'm gonna make a great decision today, right? I need to hire this person. Why are you gonna hire this person? Oh, I think they're great. Six months later, he didn't sell anything. I got that one wrong. What'd that cost me? What does it cost to invest six months into a new person that doesn't work out? Rodney's laughing, he knows. He's hired that guy a couple times, haven't you? <laughs> Never you, right? Because you use the data. But nowadays, everything can be, be done better with data. But there's a big risk there, too. So data, obviously, what, what's, what's the problem when you ask somebody a question because you believe something? So. If you want me to believe that Belmont is the greatest university on the, on the planet, and it might be true, by the way, you might ask me the question, hey, Dan, you agree with all the research that shows that Belmont's the greatest university on the planet. If I wanted to get a different answer, maybe a less biased answer, I might ask the question a different way. I'd say, hey, Stacy, what do you think the greatest university on the planet is? You're hired. <laughs> but do you see what I did there? You can ask the same question two different ways. And if Stacy wasn't so well trained, she might have said Harvard. She might have said Princeton. She might have said Vanderbilt. Is that a good thing here? Is that, am I causing trouble if I say that? OK. It's a beautiful area, by the way, all of it. I'll be happy if my kids get a degree from either of them. But. You can ask the same question two different ways, get two different answers, because I can set up my data to tell me what I want to know. I want to hire you, Sean. I want to hire you to work for me. So I'm going to ask you questions that I know you're going to answer in a certain way to prove what I already believe. Number one problem with data, bias. So there's two challenges here. One, you know, the cloud, like I said, You'd be crazy in most cases if you're a small entrepreneurial or even a growing company to not consider cloud. That's why people are moving in that direction. But with data and big data projects, having data is not enough. You have to have data and you have to have a willingness to look at data in an unbiased way because we can always manipulate information to tell us what we want to know. The second thing, companies are comfortable with these ideas of data. The other thing companies have grown comfortable with in the last five years is social media. All of your companies are embracing social now, right? And there's some really, really great reasons to do it. And social is probably one of those topics I like to talk about from a technology standpoint that's so misunderstood because most companies think they want to sell you on social media. I want to sell you an offer. I want to recruit you to my school. I want to tell you about our new product. But what do you think the number one success story with social is in terms of building relationships? Any guessers? Kent. I need like Snickers. I can throw them at people with great answers. No, absolutely, service, customer service. Did you know 
Two-thirds of people expect to be responded to anytime they digitally put a, a service request in within 24 hours. 42% expect to be responded to within two hours of any social service request. 32% of people expect to be responded to within 30 minutes of any digital or social media inbound request for service. Companies' biggest opportunities on the planet are providing service using social media. Because in the new world of communications, I'll give you something very simple. If you like to talk to people on the phone and somebody wants your time, what type of communication will you set up with them? A phone call. Yeah, you're right, Mitch. You can say it loud. Be proud. You've got it. Set up a phone call. Now, my daughter and I, you know, since she's 15, <clears throat> and I'm uh, struggling to win her affection and time because that's a very tough age, she likes Snapchat. I think Snapchat's dumb. But guess what I have on my phone? And guess how I talk to my daughter? And guess where she talks to me? And guess how I've built a better relationship with her? All right, guys, you're getting this. We're doing this together. This is a perfect size room for this. We're going to be chanting Belmont by the end of this presentation. <laughs> but this social thing isn't so much about a specific channel of social media. The social thing is all about communicating with people in the channels that they want to be communicated with, finding where people want to be reached and reaching them there. This is a way to do better business. People's options, right? How many options do you have nowadays for reaching out to a person or a company? It seems endless. So the number one trick I recommend to businesses is use data, understand where your customers are. Build your channels and responsiveness to make sure you're fastest to respond in the channels where they spend the most time. Just because you like a certain channel doesn't mean that's where you should put your energy. Put your energy where your customers like to be communicated with. Because everybody understands empathy and everybody understands respect. And when you feel like you're being empathized with and you feel like you're being respected with, instantly you're building a better relationship. So that's why I love the power of social and I'm very happy to see companies are embracing it but I'm still very scared based on the day-to-day -day interactions I have on social that everybody wants to sell you something on social, but nobody understands that the real power is serve me on social. So the other couple of trends are, one, people are basically scared to death and don't understand Internet of Things. They don't understand artificial intelligence. They don't understand um, you know, uh, cognitive computing, machine learning, and this stuff is highly complex, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it, but it does give me a good reminder that while in, the, in certain verticals in tech, we spend a lot of time hearing about what's next and what's cool and what the big trend is, but one of the biggest mistakes we can do is leaping out in front of our customers and leaping out in front of our markets. So it goes back to what we talked about with the vendor side. It's very important to be building a knowledge base and understanding. Like Internet of Things, what's the real power of Internet of Things for your business? How many of you have heard of the Internet of Things? Okay. Sorry, I just know everybody's at different levels. So I want to be kind of doing pulse checks throughout this. So all these devices, you know, the simplest way I explain, like your Fitbit, right? Anybody wearing a Fitbit here? It's reporting data back to you. It's a thing, right? It's not necessarily a connected device in the way that you would traditionally think of like a, a, a you know, a computer or a mobile phone. But it's, it's reporting data back. And all this data that it's creating can be used to make decisions, right? You've got something that can tell you what people's behaviors are. Internet of Things can be industrial, too. It can be connected in the back of a truck to look at the refrigeration of, uh, you know, your um, uh, produce, right? How long has that produce been on the truck? What was the temperature inside of that truck for the whole time that it was sent from Florida to Chicago? Why is that orange moldy by the time it gets to my store? Right? It could actually be reporting back that data. So that's really the power of Internet of Things. So most businesses don't need to understand the Internet of Things. They need to understand data. They need to understand what is possible, what kind of information and data could be provided to them that would basically allow them to provide a better customer experience or lower a cost in their supply chain. So that's those kinds of things. So there's a lot of trends, and those are some of the ones that people are most uncertain about. And obviously, things like virtual reality are also on that list, augmented reality. You guys hear of those trends too, right? Anybody strapping on headsets yet and walking around? It's pretty cool stuff, though. I'm a big soccer fan. And last summer, they had the European Championships in, um, 
and Samsung Gear VR sent me a headset and I was able to literally stand on the 50 yard line and watch France and England play each other. And I could lean over the rail and I could steer. They had the 360 cameras and you could see the, you know, the players running by you. And it, it's an amazingly immersive experience. But how does that fit into your business? And that's what a lot of companies are still struggling to understand. In media, maybe it makes sense. I could think of a few inappropriate industries where it's probably taken off. But where does it fit into you know, a traditional tech or manufacturing or education? By the way, education, I think, is a place where VR and AR is going to have a very powerful impact in the near future. I'm glad you're shaking your head because we're continuing to agree on more than we're not. And then, um, and then some of the things like 3D printing and robotics seem to be on low interest. However, when I talk a little bit more about innovation, things like 3D printing are a powerhouse for companies in terms of rapid prototyping and developing of new solutions and seeing things. So there's a lot going on in technology that people are, are sort of trying to absorb right now. And then this stuff is probably the most interesting to me. So when I started my firm, I didn't really start the firm to, to analyze the technology itself, because so many people already do that. You can go on to Engadget or Forbes, and you can read about every new tech device. But what I really wanted to study was the human impact of technology. So this stuff is really fascinating to me. And so we talk about who should lead digital transformation in an organization. Let's get a pulse check. How many people think the CIO should be the leader of digital transformation within an organization? I see a few no's. I don't see anybody saying yes. But then again, I still have that 50% of the room that wouldn't raise their hand no matter what I did. How many people want my Porsche that's outside? And uh, I'll just give you the keys if you raise your hand right now. Yep, see, I knew you could do it. OK. How many people think the CMO should lead digital transformation, the chief marketing officer inside of an organization? I see a couple hands. What about the CEO? The president of the company. So the, the most recent um, external research that I looked at from a group called Altimeter found that the number one leader in digital transformation today in most organizations has actually become the CMO, the chief marketing officer. <clears throat> but my research and what I truly believe is that the CEO should be the person leading change in any organization. And if you look at digital transformation as change management, changing your business models to be successful into the future, I do not think it should start in a line of business, and I do not think it should start inside of a marketing or a campaign department. Tran digital transformation is not a campaign. Digital transformation is preparing your business to succeed and compete into the future. So when I see this first data point that CEOs and COOs, but specifically CEOs are perceived only as having a basic understanding of technology, I immediately raise my hand and say, this is a problem. Not to say that CEOs need to be experts in technology, but CEOs, because technology is such a core to experiences and to customer experiences, need to get a better handle on all the technologies and what they can mean for their businesses. The second one I think is an obvious data point, but it was reiterated that people's perception in an organization is that their CMO and CTO are their tech savvy people, are the people that understand tech. But the third point, which I think is so important. Um, I'll get, get to that in a minute. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to skip that because it's actually really good stuff. HR is seen as technologically inferior. Why would that be a problem for anybody? Why do you guys think HR not being good at technology is a problem for your business? Do the employees get tech? What's, what's one of the most important things in your business today? Your people, right? and recruiting, and, and did anyone say retention? You guys have looked at the data. What does it cost to replace people in your organization when you lose them? And so when you're trying to recruit the best talent out there, and they come in and they talk to somebody who's like, oh, I can't meet with you on video. You want to do a, a Skype? What's a Skype? You want to do a Google Hangout, or you want to do FaceTime? No, 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 we do, um, you know, we do 800 free conference call, sir. That's where we're going to have our meeting. What's your feeling when you're looking at a new job and you meet with somebody who shows a resistance or a lack of knowledge of new technology? What's your feeling about that company? What does it become? Well, maybe that they'll be out of business, but you certainly feel like this is not a cool company. I don't want to work for this organization. They're not evolving. They're not evolving. 
Exactly. So the fact that HR at the, at the head of the spear of any organization for winning new talent and for keeping talent is from the data standpoint showing up to be technology wise at the bottom of the ladder should be really alarming for any organization that has this inside of their own. Who is running your HR and how are they embracing technology in the recruiting process? How are they embracing HR in the retention process? This is the stat I almost talked about, but I had to, I got its own slide and I just remembered that. So I said how people perceive the chief technology officer as knowing tech. But we had hundreds of CTO respondents in our surveys. And about a quarter of them only really have basic knowledge. Only a quarter of them actually acknowledged that they don't know that much about technology, that they don't know that much about these emerging trends. And here's a problem. When you're CEO, right, who does the CTO work for? And when a CEO doesn't understand technology and they hire a CTO, how do you know they made a good choice? Gut. Gut. <laughs> what do they do, like a, you know, one of those Facebook quizzes? You know, they sent a picture of a server. Oh, that's a server. He didn't know what it was. He can't have the job, but he did. He can have it. Oh, here's a picture of a, of a mobile device. Is this a Samsung or an Apple? Oh, you nailed that one. You're CTO now, sir. <laughs> All right, I've simplified it a little bit, but, but this is a big problem. You have CEOs that are delegating digital transformation. They're saying, we don't need to know much. We're the leader. We're the, we're, we sit up here. I'm going to find someone to run my transformation. And they hire technological leaders that don't understand tech. And then what ends up happening is you lose the confidence of your people that your company understands tech. Because the person who's seen in your organization as the one that should know the most isn't showing to actually know as much as they think. And like I said, this data actually shows that they admit it. When the full report comes out, you're going to see they actually acknowledge that they don't understand these complex topics like IoT and artificial intelligence and the impact that those things are going to have on business. And that should be really scary for you. And if you run a business and you have a CTO, I'm not asking you all to run back and fire anybody. And if you are the CTO, I'm not asking you to resign today. But what I am asking you to think about is how well do you understand these tech trends and the impact that they have on business, customer, and employee experiences? Now I'm going to take a little break and I'm going to show a picture of the best looking person in the room. That's you, right? That is you, right? All right. Well, what I promised is in the rest of this session, I was going to talk about six things that great companies do different. And so I had a little time to spend, and I watched a historic video. And I know not all of you are Bel Belmont alum, but like I said, anytime I travel somewhere and I talk to Dr. Fisher about it, I promise, I said, I'd like to learn a little bit about where I'm going so that my presentation can, I can try to hook in. So first, you know, the Nashville thing, hurting. But I said, I'm going to fall in love with this university. So I heard this story, and all I could think about is, if you didn't know, but Belmont's a little older than 125 years. Oh, wait, congratulations on that. I think give uh, Dr. Fisher a little round of applause for... Uh, for this building. 15, 15 of those years were you, right? Hey, you can have a job. I'm in? <laughs> I'm in. And so, but like any organization, staying great is the challenge, right? So we talk about all this disruption that's going on. I talk about all these great companies that have fallen off the, the, the scene. They're gone. To survive 125 years is, impress and is impressive. And it comes down to two things, doing the things that, are, that make a company great and then believing in what you're doing. So I love that story because it connected with me right here. A lot of companies understand what it takes to be great, but believing and doing it is a whole other thing. So let's talk about what these great companies are doing and from our research, from the books. And you guys, like I said, are on the precipice because you're reading about my dragons. But I'm actually in the process of writing my next book called Future Proof where I study what 15 of the world's greatest companies are doing and how they're succeeding at digital transformation. So you guys are getting the previews. First of its kind, Jill. 
I did this just for you. So we talked about this a little bit. The future of business will be based upon experiences. How many of you guys agree with this? You buy based on an experience that you are created with a company. Now this isn't just something to think about and consider. This is something that's become overwhelmingly true. Just this year, a study came out. Almost 90% of companies believe right now that their number one competitive differentiator will be the experiences they create. 90%, that means nine out of 10. That means you and everyone else are trying to create great experiences. Just five years ago, what, what percentage do you think that was at, Rodney? You sit up close, you get put on the spot. Thirty, not bad though. You're hired. Everybody's getting hired today. Thirty percent. So in five years, we went from less than one third of companies thinking they're competing on experiences to almost every company believing they're competing on experiences. You know, and, I, and providing a couple examples for you. Any Disney fans here? I'm not going to spend a ton of time. Everybody knows Disney is an experience company, right? Everybody knows when you go to the park, everything you do in that park is measured, monitored. You put on that magic band, and they are going to spend the next day, three days, five days, seven days, trying to most closely match every like that you've ever submitted in your trip planning and journey is as closely matched as possible. <laughs> I even tell the story of Disney and their use of data to make sure their, their theme parks are clean. Have anybody heard the story of the Disney and their garbage cans? Did I hear a yes? Okay. Because one yes isn't enough to stop me from telling the story. <laughs> so Disney, for a long time, has, has used data to, to help create a better experience, right? There's like, have you guys ever been to a Six Flags? The rides are actually better, by the way, at a Six Flag, if you like thrill rides. But everybody loves Disney. Nobody talks about Six Flags, right? So Six Flags actually, the original data project was they put people out in the park to watch people's behavior from a concession stand. So you'd go to a concession stand, you'd buy a hot dog and a drink, and they would see the person. They'd get the hot dog, they'd put their mustard on it. I'm from Chicago, we don't do ketchup. Put ketchup, that's gross. And then you'd watch how fast they eat the hot dog, and they'd walk away. And basically, they were monitoring people's behavior as to how far they were willing to walk before they dropped their wrapper. They dropped their cup, put it down on the curb, right? In a great experience environment, it'd be clean, right? Anybody ever gone to a hotel room that's dirty? You like that? You get in the back of a taxi or an Uber, it smells bad, it's, it's dirty, you like that? No, people want cleanliness. And so they actually started out their data project by actually just having people literally qualified data, watching it, looking and saying, oh, at about 30 steps, it turns out that people will drop their stuff and they'll litter all over the park. And then you have a gross, dirty park. Nobody wants to go to a gross, dirty park. So they actually started placing garbage cans. They determined it was like 24 and a half steps. So every 24 and a half steps in every direction you could possibly walk away from a concession stand Guess what there was? A trash can. These are the most subtle little experiences that you could ever think about. You know, Tesla, everybody kind of understands what they're doing with experiences. But I also like to talk, because I know you guys are smaller business. Anyone ever had a cup of Phil's coffee? Been to San Francisco? So Phil's believes everybody is entitled to a special cup of coffee, their cup of coffee, right? Their flavor, their taste, their brew. It's hand brewed coffee. You walk up to like a barista and you tell them the flavors, the scents, the aromas that you like. Okay? And it's just as fast as Starbucks, maybe even faster. And it tastes good because Starbucks is gross. Um, great experience, not great coffee necessarily. Any Starbucks employees in here? Just want to make sure I didn't make any enemies now. So Phil's, their whole thing was that everybody on the planet, so it's personalization. You all deserve your perfect cup of coffee. Fast, delicious, affordable. You walk in, it's brewed right in front of you, exactly to your taste, taken out of there. They basically understand 
what people expect and about creating great experiences. And so you guys, and I'm asking this maybe of the Belmont crowd, what experience are you creating? What experience do you create for students, for faculty? I know you're not all students and faculty, but I do happen to have a key decision maker in the room. So if I asked you, put you on the spot, what is the experience that you believe you create that differentiates Belmont from other universities? 30 seconds. did it in 15. But that's the understanding so many businesses lack. You raise your hand, you're all going, yeah, we're competing on experiences. Well, what's that experience that you're, you're creating for me? When I rent that car from Enterprise, I see all these Enterprise tags up here. What experience are you creating for me that I can't get at Avis, that I can't get at Budget, that I can't get from whatever other rental car company, I can't remember all their names. But my point is, you know, you got taglines and you got mission statements, but the experience isn't those things. It's not how you market yourself. It's the actual impression you leave with somebody. You go to Disney, you go home and you tell everybody about your experience, right? When you go to a resort all inclusive in Mexico and it was a wonderful experience, you tell everybody. When you get out from behind the wheel of that Tesla and you had it in that berserk mode and it was zero to 60 in two seconds, you tell everybody about that experience that it's created for you, right? People will compete, and companies will compete on experiences. The second one, and I know I've got to speed up. I've taken a little long. I'm sorry about that. Am I okay? It's about 8.27. I'm so, you guys are so fun. I just want to keep talking to you. Businesses always have and always will be about people. And this is probably one of the easiest things that companies get lost in the age of technology. But I say, do not throw technology at people problems. Because people don't buy technology to solve technology problems. They, they buy technology to make companies better, to create better organizations, to create. But if your people are not on board, if your culture is not moving along, and this is one of the biggest things we found in our dragons, and when you read this book, is that I set out to write a book about technological transformation, and I ended up writing a book about culture and change. Is because all my research found is that your company can buy the third best, fifth best, tenth best CRM system, and if you have a great culture of people who believe in the business and in the vision, you will succeed. And if you have the best solution out there, you buy the ultimate supremo package of salesforce.com and you have people that hate their jobs, they won't use it, they won't do it well, you will spend a lot of money and you will get very little out of it. Technology cannot solve your people problems. When you build a great culture, people understand your vision, they buy into what you're doing, the technology will be used and embraced, innovation will happen, customers will be happier, employees will stay longer, you will win. And it's all on the premise of this third trait of these great companies, is that they understand adaptability. They understand how hard it is to change, right? There's a saying, the only thing people like less than everything staying the same is change. People do not like to be uncomfortable. And specifically, what they don't like is change that they don't understand and change they think will impact them. So if you ask them to change, to try something new, and they do not understand why it is beneficial to them, you buy that new CRM, you give them that new phone, right? But I really like my BlackBerry. Any BlackBerry users in here? Why would I want an iPhone? Well, that's the one where everybody understood why they wanted it, right? But when you say, hey, you know what, this, here's a great one. How many of y'all do expense reports? How many of you like doing expense reports? I still remember like three different companies I worked at where I'd get like, you know, it used to be like you'd put your receipts in an envelope and you'd create a little spreadsheet and you'd put your list of stuff, you'd send it and you'd get a check. And then someone comes to you and, oh, we're using this new software, sir. And you're gonna have to put every one of your receipts on order by date. And then you're going to have to fill out this form, and you'll get a check in six to eight weeks. This is a great system, isn't it? I'm trying to sound like the guy in accounting that told me that was great. 
it got so bad that I stopped expensing stuff. Like I would just pay for it because I didn't want to wait eight weeks and go through four hours of work because I was going to lose business in the process of trying to do an expense report. I didn't understand what the investment did for me. So I didn't want to change. I didn't invest in the change. And that kind of resistance is absolutely killer to culture. So while someone in accounting or someone in executive leadership goes, this is really going to help us be more organized, everybody in the field goes, I hate this. And I'm going to resist it every chance I get. That culture begets more negativity. That negativity breeds the demise of organizations. And anyone that's ever been in a restaurant or been in a retail store where people are clearly like, go into retail now, go into Macy's, go into Sears, talk to the people that work at them. See how happy they are. See what kind of culture those companies have created. It's toxic in many cases. And that toxic culture is almost impossible to get out from underneath. So remember, people and change, adaptability is the key to becoming great. And I love to give these examples because all you BlackBerry users in here, now I talked about Blockbuster. Do you know that Kodak had, the, had digital photography in 1979? How many of you are using a Kodak to take pictures today? Nobody. BlackBerry owned the enterprise phone market. They owned it. Any Blackberries? Anybody going to go buy a book from Barnes and Nobles today? These companies all were there. They were the biggest, strongest. We call them, you know, they were the most powerful organizations in their fields. They're all gone or virtually gone today. And all of them had one major issue. They all resisted change. So I, I told you, you know, about the Netflix blockbuster story. This will be a little bit thematic as I roll into the end here. Is what did Netflix offer the market first? But what was the first product you could get? Subscription, DVDs in the mail, right? That's not really all that exciting, is it? You could order a DVD, it came in the mail. But they solved two major problems for people. What were those two problems? Yeah, nobody wanted to drive, and nobody liked paying late fees, OK? That was all they really solved for you. People started subscribing. Blockbuster wasn't really scared of them. But what did Blockbuster do? Same thing, right? Now, what was Netflix? What were they really thinking about doing while they were busy mailing DVDs to people? What was Netflix's real strategy? Streaming. What was Blockbuster's real strategy? Copying, right? Seriously, that was their strategy. So Netflix was you know, wagging the dog. You guys heard that term? They were wagging the dog. They were basically saying, OK, we're going to do this. You're going to look right. And over here on the left, we're building this, right? And then they started streaming. And what did Blockbuster do? Bef this was a little before they went on business. What did Blockbuster do? They started streaming. But they'd already lost so much market share because Netflix had already won the affection of the market for being more innovative, more disruptive. Blockbuster started streaming. Their customer base was falling off. They were copying, imitating, but nobody cared. They were losing customers, losing market, losing, losing revenue every day to Netflix. But Netflix had a partnership with a guy named Kevin Spacey. Ever heard of Kevin Spacey? And they launched their own original programming. And on the day that House of Cards came out, not only did the entire media world take notice, but in my opinion, that was pretty much, that was pretty much checkmate. Because you could maybe copy a mail service. You could possibly go into the cloud and copy a streaming service. But every time that Netflix put their pawn out there, Blockbuster did the same thing. And all of a sudden, they'd put all their pawns out, and the queen was looking right at the king. And that was the day Netflix launched that series. Original program, Blockbuster just couldn't follow. So that's what it came down to, employees and companies that are agile and adaptable. So let's talk about the fourth one. Failing fast is not just a marketing term. How many of you heard the term fail fast? Yeah. And here's the big thing, and our research has found, is that fail fast is a wonderful idea from a leadership and motivational speaker because it sounds like this really great concept. Like, we support failure because every great success started in failure. But there is some truth to it because failing fast, when you take it out of the marketing context, is actually one of the most important things that businesses can do. And I'm going to give you a different way of looking at it. Fail faster to succeed sooner. So a couple of good examples for you. Um, 
Starbucks, who I said I don't like their coffee, but a very innovative company, designed the third place, which by the way, you know, you ever go work at a Starbucks? The third place? What? No, 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 that too, that's really cool. But I'm talking about like the idea that you just go there and work. Like people that go into Starbucks and just hang out and work with the internet and they're connected, third place. Like you have your home office, you have your work office and you have the third place, right? But they had, did you ever hear of Tivana? That didn't do very well, did it? No, that's their tea, but you ever actually go to their Tivana stores? Didn't do very well, did it? How about McCafes, McDonald's? Now, both of them still have iterations of those solutions. You can still get a McCafe drink, and you can still get Tivana tea, but they put those particular ideas into market, realized they didn't work, got them out of market extremely quickly, and their businesses continued to propel, right? Now, a lot of companies, their whole innovation and design strategy is have an innovative design thinker come up with an idea, launch that idea, run it through its idea cycle, and then determine at some point along the line if that idea was good, they stay with that idea. But companies that are actually using this, it's not about failing fast, it's about innovation design methodologies. It's about how fast can you prototype an idea, get it into market, and fail. There's a company called IDEO that actually helps companies design solutions, and they were working with a toy company, and of over 2,000 ideas, only 48 of them were any good. That's what they determined. But they were able to actually rapid prototype, ideate, and come up with over 2,000 toy ideas in a short period of time to be able to solve which 48 toys should actually get into the marketplace. Now, a lot of companies, what they do is they don't have any strategy for getting things to market quickly. So I look at it very simple. Here's the analogy. If your innovation new product launch cycle, whatever your product is, if you're a service company, if you're a, a tech provider, if you're a, a toy store, your innovation process has a period of time. You can look at between each new product you've launched, how long it's taken, between each new service you've sold to people, maybe it takes three years, two years, and then how long it took to get to market. So if you can take that two year cycle and you can start a fast design cycle with failure built in, because you got tolerances for that, and you say, we're gonna do that in six months. Well, guess what? You could have four ideas. You could launch four different ideas. And as long as any one of those four ideas succeeded, you will actually have gone through, probably uh, been able to identify a better solution and still gotten it out in that same 24 month cycle. That's what failing fast to succeed sooner means. It means having a plan to rapid prototype, to get new ideas into the market, to start s delivering solutions, managing data, understanding what customers' wants and needs are, and shifting quickly so that you can deliver the things people want. Fifth one I really talked about, and since we are a little bit on time, I'm not gonna to touch on this for too long, but digital transformation is a business transformation. Think about it that way. Think about it for these things, okay? You wanna make your customers happier. You wanna stop losing customers. You wanna use the tech, use your transformation to help this. And you really wanna make more money. Anybody in here now wanna make more money in your businesses? This is why you transform. Even if you're not for profit, you still wanna make more money. And if your transformation is for any reason, if it doesn't start with this as the macro objectives, the micro objectives don't matter. And the last one is what I call culture and leadership and the X factor. The X factor of all the companies that are great is their cultures are stronger, more connected, and more unified than the businesses that they are competing with and the businesses that they have basically put out. And I'll tell you one more story because I've thematically mentioned Netflix throughout this entire presentation, is Netflix, when they started off, had a chief human resource officer that had one of the most innovative ideas ever. At the end of each year, the chief human resources officer had a process of actually re-interviewing every candidate. And the idea was, if they wouldn't still hire you today, they got rid of you. And it wasn't a, a, a cold-hearted thing. The point of it was people evolve and change. And so companies hire people, and then they sort of put them in the culture, and they just leave them there. And most people don't want to deal with the hardship of change and, and, and getting rid of the toxic people in culture. So they just find ways to push them out, bury them, or hope they just leave on their own eventually. Well, Netflix said, you know what, we want to make sure that every year that the people that are here want to be here. So we're gonna basically make sure that we invest in 
hiring them over and over again. So they also re-interviewed them and promoted them. They re-interviewed them and gave them more money. But they said, you know what, if today I wouldn't hire you again, then why are you still here? And this was the way they weeded out and created the strongest culture they have. And they are by far one of the greatest disruption and innovation stories that this side of the world has today. And I want to show you guys some of that data I told you about companies in that five-year model. So between 20, 2000 and 2010, 40% of the Fortune 500 have been replaced. So they're either out of business or they're no longer Fortune 500 companies, which is an amazing, amazing thing in itself. But one of the actual predictions that have come out from a peer of mine in his research was that in just a few years, that could be as great as 70%. 70% of what we know is the world's greatest companies, the fortune companies, the models of business success could be gone. And that's all due to rate of change, slow transformation, lack of vision, lack of innovation, and as I mentioned, companies that have not been able to sustain a culture that can change and adapt fast enough to stay profitable and thrive in this digital economy. So for all of you out here, you know, all this content I share with you, becoming great is a choice that every company really does have. And it starts with a belief. And that's the words that, that you had here, Dr. Fisher, about Belmont is, you can't achieve great if you don't believe in what your mission is as great. And so many companies right now are floundering, they're lost, they're unsure. You know, a third of companies are digital when really everybody should be digital. Companies have technology leaders that don't understand technology. We have CEOs that are resisting. These are changes that don't need technology to fix. These are changes that need people to fix. And I guarantee you, I showed you that slide. I showed you that slide with, with Blackberry and with with Blockbuster and Kodak and all those companies that have been so abruptly disrupted and put out of business. And I guarantee you, in 2009, when that Blockbuster CEO answered that interview about being afraid of, of Netflix, he genuinely was not afraid of Netflix. He was the biggest, strongest company on the planet. But it basically comes down to this. There isn't a company on the planet that sets out to be disrupted. It's just most of the time, these companies stop doing all the things that once made them great, opening the door for their competition to put them into their own place of obsolescence. Thank you everybody very much. I'm gonna take any questions that you guys have.